first thing we have to talk about, as always, when we get into these old movies, is life in 1968. And to give you just some little bare bones stuff to think about, costs of things. The average cost of a new house was about $14,000, almost $15,000. In today's dollars, that would be about $108,000. So probably doing better in terms of a house, particularly in a major metropolitan area. Try buying that in San Francisco now. Your average income was around $7,800 a year, which currently translates into about $57,000. So that places it above the median income right now in the U.S., which is 40, 42, something like that. Uh, Larry says, uh, 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey, Planet of the Apes, and uh, are what I care about remembering. Yes. I'm going to get into some of the movies that were in of this period. Yeah, the, uh, the ones I've reviewed, I think, are the ones that I care about as well. Yeah. Average monthly rent, if you were renting back then, would be about $130. Today, that would be about $940. So for a good apartment, probably doing better there, especially in a major metropolitan area. Try finding a decent apartment for that amount of money. Price of a gallon of gas was $0.34. Cents. Today, that would be $2.47, not far off from where we are today. The average cost of a movie ticket was $1.50. Today, that translates into ten eighty-eight. But you know what? That ain't what going to a movie actually costs you. If I'm going to a movie, particularly if I'm on a date, you can expect to pay at least thirty to forty dollars, both for the tickets and to buy the incredibly overpriced um, concessions and all of that. It just adds up and it's crazy. Um, so if you're only paying ten eighty eight, a uh, buck fifty back then, probably doing a little better on the movies than we would be now. The federal hourly minimum wage, which had been instituted by that time, was $1.60 an hour. That translates into $11.62 today. So with the minimum wage, if you're making it, you're probably doing better. Some things that were going on in that time period in both Europe and Japan and America, um, Japanese imports were starting to become a thing. And they would become more and more and more of a thing until the present day where we get almost everything overseas. Um, this was beginning to become a concern of the United Kingdom and USA governments because they worried that industries in their own country would suffer and jobs would be lost. And looking now from the prism of 2018, that is precisely what happened. If we look at Detroit, at one time a booming economy because they made a huge amount of the cars that were sold in the U.S. And look at it now, a dangerous ghetto very much. There was also a flu pandemic this year in Hong Kong in 1968. Some events, oh man, were there events going on that would shape history for generations to come. Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated this year. Robert Kennedy was assassinated this year. President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which increased some of the civil rights uh, that black people had previously not enjoyed. The peace movement had continued to grow, and more and more people in America were against the Vietnam War. And there were riots throughout cities in the United States over this. And the uh, music scene was largely dominated by the Beatles. They had released their White Album that year, and also the Rolling Stones, very big. Fashion had changed a bit. Many skirts uh, and see-through blouses were coming around. And the first Black Power salute was seen on TV during the Olympics during a medal ceremony. Interestingly enough, and I did not know this, um, Intel was formed in 1968. I, I always thought that would be thought that would be placed later in the timeline, but no, it was it first formed in 1968. Larry says, I got in a Star Wars matinee during the first week of the premiere in 1977 for about five. Yeah, yeah. I, I think personally I remember it being more like $3 about then. Um, but yeah, oh, just a hell of a lot cheaper than it is now. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Some of the more interesting things in terms of aerospace, the Surveyor 7 probe landed on the moon. you got to remember this was a year prior to Apollo 11, the manned landing on the moon. The Boeing 747 made its first maiden sl flight that year. Uh, NASA launched Apollo 7, which was the first manned Apollo mission, which you have to remember is Apollos 1 through 10 were test vehicles. When they talk about going to Mars, 
They haven't tested a damned thing necessary to do it. You need to run tests. You can't just send a rocket out there and hope for the best. You're going to have to send multiple iterations that don't land so that you can test various parts of the system and see that they're going to work on that horribly long, long trip to Mars. So Apollos 1 through 10 were test vehicles. That same year, Apollo 8 orbited the moon, which became the first manned space mission to ever achieve that feat. Again, testing. Can we get there? Can we get in orbit? Can we come back? Airbags were invented that year, although they wouldn't be common in cars for decades to come. The first successful heart transplant was in 1968. The emergency uh, 911 system was started at that point. And the first ATMs were installed by the first Philadelphia bank. And those are something also that would not become standard until the late 1970s, early 1980s, through the 1980s. There was an election that year, and Richard Milhouse Nixon defeated Hubert Humphrey and George Wallace. One of the few times that someone other than a Democrat or a Republican actually mattered on the ballot. Uh, films that were very popular at the time. The Graduate, Who's Coming to Dinner? Uh, Bonnie and Clyde, The Valley of the Dolls, The Odd Couple, the movie, not the TV show, Planet of the Apes, and Rosemary's Baby. We were getting seriously into rock and roll by then. The Rolling Stones were big, The Supremes, The Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, Aretha Franklin, Gary Puckett, and The Union Gap. The Grateful Dead, The Monkees, Simon and Garfunkel, The Beach Boys, The Bee Gees, Jimi Hendrix, Cream, The Doors, Pink Floyd, Moody Blues, Bobby Golds Goldsboro, Marvin Gaye, and David Bowie. As I say, really moving along in terms of rock music by the end of, by the, end of the decade. Now, fashions. always like to show you what people were wearing back then. This is kind of what a conservative man's fashion might look like. A suit, tie, uh, maybe a sport jacket that didn't necessarily uh, match the, uh, uh, the pants, uh, but a suit and tie, that's what a conservative person might wear. And point of fact, uh, this uh, screen cap comes from an episode of Dragonet, which was a very conservative show. And so the people that you saw there would have been wearing conservative clothing. This is what most people who were not hippies would be wearing. Now, you might get away sometimes without the shirt, without the tie, without the jacket, particularly if you were growing up, you'd get a t-shirt, usually very colorful. Um, colors were very, very big in this uh, decade. Like we said, Apollo 10 could have landed if they'd had enough fuel uh, to take off. Yeah, I believe the story is, in fact, um, that NASA intentionally did not give them that because they were terribly afraid they would go ahead and try the landing anyway. And I understand that. Hell, if it had been me, I would have too. First man to land on the moon gets their names in the history books. Everybody remembers Neil Armstrong. Name off for me the other astronauts on that mission. Hard for most people to do. So this was a conservative man's attire. Still suits and ties. This is what you'd see if you're walking down the street with conservative men. Women's fashions, well, they started to evolve, frankly, into the sort of thing that we might even see today with some alterations. Uh, pants were a thing back then, although they're not in this picture. Uh, this comes from a, a catalog of the era. And so this is what a relatively conservative woman might be wearing, non-hippie would be wearing. Um, a weird thing about this era, from the late 1960s all the way through the uh, early to mid-1970s, Women wore wigs just because. I remember my mom had a wig. It was kind of normal. Um, they wouldn't use the regular hair. They would wear a wig. Uh, go figure. This is, by the way, when you see Star Trek, the original series, and you see that they're wearing wigs sometime, that was just the style of the time. Women wore wigs for no good reason. In fact, I would hazard a guess, looking at the pic, that uh, the woman there who is wearing the uh, yellow dress, looking at it, I'd have to guess she's wearing a wig. And the one, the blonde, may also be wearing a wig. Don't know why. That was just fashion. Women tended to wear wigs. So, then we get into the counterculture. The counterculture was made up of what is generally called the baby boom generation. And they use this term counterculture 
the biggest proponents. Uh, Larry says, I got to wear a Nehru shirt in junior high school for the first time in 1968. Bit older than me. Um, but, but yeah, you'd probably know those uh, kids' fashions even better than I would. Uh, it's great if you can watch Dragnet and you see kids or watch the Brady Bunch and you can see what they're wearing. Um, man, uh, colors. <laughs> Not too terrifyingly different in terms of, you know, our style today. It's just colors. You know, this vest that I'm wearing is very colorful. Wouldn't even hold a candle to some of the colors that came out of the 60s. The 60s became a very colorful generation. And again, I remember some of it. Not much, but I remember more of how it bled into the 1970s. So the, the baby boom generation gave birth to a counterculture, and those counterculture they're not were people, mostly they're hippies. Heavy. The hippies liked rock music of that era, and there was a ton of it. We were clearly getting into rock and roll at that point. Uh, Larry says, TV used bright, co bright colors to sell live TV. Yeah, the reason, the reason that on Star Trek, the original series, they have such bright colored uniforms is because B the NBC was billing itself at that time as the all-color network. And so Star Trek had a lot of colors, even in things like the sets and background uh, lighting that they used. Uh, it was to push the color televisions and the color TV uh, uh, networks. Now, the hippies of this time period, they liked rock and roll. They liked it a lot. They also liked drugs, particularly marijuana and LSD. And they liked communism. And they liked sex. They called it free love at the time. Now, you have to remember that this generation was the first one that had the benefit of the birth control pill. That is an enormous, enormous uh, thing to happen. It changed all of society, and we're still seeing the ramifications today. What people today, especially women growing up now, have to remember is, prior to the invention of the birth control pill, any time a woman had sex, there was a significant possibility that she might get pregnant. And that's why not having sex until you got married was a big thing prior to the birth control pill. But this generation was the first one that had it and turned sex into something that was not just for procreation, but for uh, 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 recreation. Recreational sex became a thing. And they did quite a lot of it. This is pre what we think of as most uh, STDs, although they were called venereal diseases back then. And uh, those, the ones that they had really were uh, syphilis and gonorrhea, which mostly could be treated by then. Uh, Larry says they had communes. <laughs> the hippies loved communism. They loved having communes. As far as I know, all of them have failed. And uh, not surprisingly, communism never works. Beyond all that... I am unclear what they thought they were actually going to accomplish, because in reality, they accomplished precisely dick. To this day, the baby boomers and the hippies think that they ended the Vietnam War. And if you look at history, no. The Vietnam War ended for totally different reasons. Now, as I say, this is inside of my lifetime, but just barely. I sort of remember it, and I sort of remember it being stupid. I still think that it was really, really stupid. My opinion hasn't changed in 50 years. In fact, it's only become more critical with age because I think the hippies and their generations are the one that I blame for really fracking up society, and we are still seeing its effects. And Larry says, free love, free speech, free thought. Tune in, turn on, and drop out was a common thing to say. Um, they really thought that LSD was something that was absolutely consciousness-altering that gave you a much more clear picture of the, of the world. Of course, what we know now is it just fracks up your brain and gives you, bad, gives you amazing hallucinations. But in real life, it's not making you more in touch with the universe, which is what they thought it was back then. Ridiculous. But the counterculture was deeply involved as a reaction to the Vietnam War. Vietnam War was a very costly war in terms of lives. Uh, however, to be honest, compared to other wars of the 20th century, it wasn't that much different. Uh, 
If you look at World War II, that was far, far worse. Uh, Larry's mentioning Timothy Leary. Oh, God, yes, Timothy Leary. Uh, to this day, something, well, I'm not sure if he's around anymore, but at last I knew, still a proponent of LSD. Uh, they actually had LSD clinics where you could go and have your consciousness altered by essentially a chemical that's fracking up your brain and giving you hallucinations. And that's all there really is to it. But the Vietnam War was very costly. It was also the first war that we saw on television every night, soldiers coming home, dead soldiers in body bags. And hippies saw this war as completely meaningless because this was the second time, with Korean War being the first, that a proxy war was being waged between the forces of communism and freedom. That's actually what was happening. And young people were being drafted and sent to die and fight in a war that hippies did not think mattered to them at all. Now, I have some longer-term pictures of that. My father once said, and I didn't get it until I was much older, the Vietnam War was a battle in what amounted to a much larger war against um, communism. And the hippies may have been right on some level. Uh, Larry says body count was shown every night on, uh, on the news. Yeah, yeah, you would see these body bags coming in with dead soldiers, and they would tell you how many had been killed that day, which did not happen in World War II. The casualty rate in World War II was way worse. You know, if you were like on a bomber or something, uh, in, in Europe, you could probably count your life expectancy in how many missions you ran. It was almost a certainty that at some point you would be killed. So they were protesting that. You can see that here in this pic. They were protesting a lot of what went on. Now, the baby boomers may have been right in some respects, but they ended up embracing communism. And that fracked up everything and continues to do so to the present day. They went on to take the reins of power as they got older and in the process basically screwed everything up. Because of them, we now have an educational system that teaches nothing but indoctrinates socialist and communist philosophies. We have an entire generation in a, into our second that are now voting that are illiterate Ignorami. And I always like to talk about my own experience here because I was for three years an instructor at a junior college at the place that shall not be named. And I have a lot of anecdotes and I have a lot of anecdotes showing just how illiterate they were. In IT, my students had difficulty differentiating between the words Linux, L-I-N-U-X, and Linksys, L-I-N-K-S-Y-S. And that wasn't the worst of it. In one particularly memorable occasion, I was tutoring a student. Now, when you're an instructor, one of the things you really get to, you like to look at, you like to see, is when the light bulb goes on over the head. You know, when you're working with a student, they don't understand something, and oh, okay, I get it now. And as an instructor, you go, oh, that's great. You know, that's what you like to see. It's what you live for. I was with this student, and the light bulb went on in a place that I really wasn't happy to see it. The light bulb went on when the student realized that books have page numbers. In 12 years of compulsory education, and certainly not well for re uh, recreational purposes, this student had never once cracked a book. And yet this student had been passed out of high school. And I have others. One of the most memorable ones was when a student who was taking what amounted to a remedial math class because they didn't teach them any math in uh, the schools, got into a massive argument with his Ph.D. level math instructor that division by zero was possible. In fact, it got so bad that he eventually stormed out of the room, went straight down to uh, the uh, administration offices, and tried to file a grievance against that instructor on the basis that the instructor was anti-Semitic. Fortunately, the instructor was Jewish. That sort of thing happened a lot. It became terribly clear to me that we have an entire generation of illiterate ignorami coming out of schools having been taught nothing. Nothing. 
We also have a generation now that believes in the destruction of free speech. Social justice warriors, or NPCs, which I think is a fantastically funny thing to call them, are the intellectual heirs, like it or not, of the hippies. Now, I have to tell you, my generation has a lot to account for here. What we should have done is what they should do now, which is fire every single teacher in every single school, everywhere, in the kindergarten through 12th range. And if possible, get rid of all of the instructors and professors at the college and university level. I've spoken before in other shows about how we can do something where we have real education after that. But that is at least what we should have done. We should have kicked them all out and insisted on something else. But to be honest, were it not for our parents' generation, we would have been better students. I mean, better uh, parents ourselves. Because of the uh, baby boomers, we now have a political system that is corrupt to its core. And we now have a protest movement that learned from the hippies that peaceful protest accomplishes precisely dick. And we call these people Antifa. They are fascists, often communists, and a violent group, as has recently been showed with Tucker Carlson. And like it or not, guys, the hip, the, uh, those guys, the Antifa, are the intellectual heirs of the hippies. The difference is they learned that being peaceful doesn't get you anywhere. Virtually everything that is negative in modern society can ultimately be traced back to the counterculture and hippies of the 1960s. One of the few times when I like to talk about Eric Cartman. They're not people, they're hippies! As he famously said... They're not hippies. They're not people. They're hippies. They screwed it all up. 